Thank you, and thanks for the opportunity to speak here. And um, for all our visitors, welcome to Brisbane. I hope you get a chance to see Brisbane and a lot of Australia if you can, particularly some of the areas that I'll be showing uh, in this presentation. Um, as Peter just mentioned, I have been working on field robotics for 13 years now. Um, and my passion is around getting robots to operate in natural environments doing real thing. And this is just some, hopefully this will play, yep, here we go. Uh, some examples, I, I do primarily focus on marine, but I have done terrestrial and other things. And the common thread throughout these applications is we're using vision uh, to uh, navigate, get around and actually do some tasks. Now, um, I'm part of the Australian Centre for Robotic Vision, and one of our mottos is to create robots at sea. Well, that's just not enough for me as well. So I actually want them to do something, and I want them to do it in the wild. And by the wild, I mean the natural environment here. And um, from my... I heard Rod's... Uh, plenary this morning, I was actually really carried. He went on a bit of a rant. I went, I'm going on a sort of a micro rant, lowercase rant. Um, oops, sorry. My laptop has literally died. Okay. Um, you often see applications in all of the vision papers that say, this, this technique will work out in the environment. We've got a you know, we're doing this, and they, they do slight modifications to the images, um, and they say, yes, it will work in the environment. When you actually take those algorithms out and you're trying to run it on real hardware and real lighting conditions, they just fail. And I spend a lot of my time trying to assess, you know, how these systems are working. And what I'm trying to do is what I'm calling perception to action. I want to understand the scene. I want to do a uh, decision-making process and then actually execute that task. Now, the trip, uh, typical way that we might do this is we see, so we observe the environment to make our moving uh, uh, judgment decision. An example of that might be obstacle avoidance. So we might use vision to actually see an obstacle. Um, and we can now start to extend that for the decision process. If we want to start following collision regulations, if we want to navigate in a cluttered marine environment so that we follow the rules of the, rules of the sea. But there's another way that if you can't actually get a good observation of the environment, well, can you actually move to see, move to see better? So if you actually don't know what you know, the, the full scene is, well, you can actually um, move. And in this case, the example might be, well, intercept a white boat that has a certain registration number. You have to find it, that type of thing. So in this case, we're actually moving the camera around to actually observe what we're trying to um, do. Now, obviously, I'm just going to go through probably the obvious probably preaching and converted. Some of the challenges that we face, obviously, when we apply robot vision uh, in the wild, direct sun, um, you know, moonlight, um, dark skies, you know, normal things. But in the marine environment, we might have a nice pristine day out on the reef, a bit of wind, and just gets absolutely horrible. And we still want our robots to operate in these conditions. Motion blur. So if we go back to this case here, if we... If you look at most visual odometry algorithms that are out there, they're usually using forward-facing cameras. Well, in this particular scene in the bottom right, that's going to have very limited effect. So a lot of the time, we're actually looking downwards. If you're looking downwards very close to seabed, you have other issues like motion blur, which can cause major headaches, actually. Other areas is if um, this is... Uh, if you actually... Uh, I highly recommend if you do get the Great Barrier Reef... Um, if you look at the water ripple, it creates these caustic lines that go across. If you have a visual odometry system, um, there's not much features in there, you can actually start to track it. You can actually um, throw out your, your VO system, um, which starts to follow these features and not the actual ground truth. But then you can actually get situations where you have perfect weather, you know, you might have actually perfect um, conditions, but in marine environment, we have full reflectivity here. So if you're trying to use vision for shoreline detection, it's a real problem. Now, if you're using LiDAR, that's actually quite a nice scene because LiDAR isn't ref uh, uh, reflected much by the water, so you'd actually be able to see the, the scene. But if you're using vision, it can be actually quite difficult. But that's sort of just the, the part around the image processing. But I'm actually interested in applying this on real robots. So one of the issues that we have is, well, if we, we've got a typical robot, we need some sort of localization system, we need power, we need some sort of computation, 
and a lot of time we need com uh, communications. Now I work in the marine environment, so I have pretty much as soon as I go underwater, I have zero GPS. I don't have a PowerPoint, so I'm going to be running on batteries. My batteries are just about twice as much as what a uh, NVIDIA GP100 uses, um, so I can't use that level of computational grunt, so I've got to use next best sort of low power option. And pretty much we have zero um, communications underwater, unless you're using acoustics, but still limited bandwidth. So these are some of the challenges we're facing. So if, if we're actually using, oh, and sorry, one last point. If I'm starting to apply algorithms and I have some sort of commercial motive, even though they might be open source, the license changes and you might not actually be able to use certain algorithms without paying a pretty hefty license fee. So in terms of application space, traditionally we might consider the, for a robot we need sort of these components, we need a perception, we need some way of understanding the scene, some way to decision and plan with it and then do some action. But for the clients that I work with, that's actually pretty much irrelevant. Um, I know we spend a lot of our time doing that. It's actually around the data and or the task that we're trying to execute. And um, from them, they actually just want it to work. They want it to be predictable and achieve the, the science objective that they're interested in. And that's where I focus a lot of my time uh, is trying to do this. So yesterday in the welcome, uh, Alan Finkel actually threw up a picture of a, uh, a robot that we've developed here at QT. So I'm actually going to focus a lot of this talk now on that. I've sort of rejigged the talk a bit. And it's on Cranathorn starfish population control. So this is an application of using robots in the wild uh, for a cause uh, that's quite dear to me, which is protection of the Great Barrier Reef. I'll give you a bit of background why we're doing this, because Alan said we've built a killer robot, and yes, we technically have. Um, but I'll hopefully convince you that it's for a good cause. Um, so these crown of thorn starfish uh, identify as a threat. They actually eat coral, okay? So they are native to our waters. Um, and they, so as an example, a healthy reef would probably have about 30 or 40 in the size of the grand hall that we have all our um, displays and, uh, and interactive displays there. But the problem is now due to uh, catchment practices, we've actually put too much nutrients in the water and we've actually created blooms that are unnatural. And these starfish eat vast tracts of, um, uh, of coral and they've been identified up to about 40% of our coral loss has been due to these starfish. Now the current method is to use a diver and they inject the starfish with a solution, a salt, um, and they um, obviously need got quite a lot of hand-eye coordination and that will kill the starfish. And they've been very effective at where they're operating. The problem is Great Barrier Reef is the size of Italy, or bigger, actually. Um, so they just can't be everywhere at the same time. So we need ways of trying to upscale the, the, the project. Now, there's, just to give you an idea of what they do, when they're in plague proportions, that white stuff is after they've eaten the coral, and it probably will not recover from that. So. Um, yeah, so it's a play proportion there. Now, to give you, this is actually work that I started in 2005. I wrote a paper around using uh, feature-based detection of crown of thorn starfish. And at the time, I was pretty happy with it. Oops. Um, you know, I'm probably getting about 70% classification performance. That so was great back then. Um, but there was two limitations that we had. One was the uh, computational power and sort of some of the politics around using... Uh, robots uh, for killing crown of thorns uh, was just too limited and uh, we weren't really allowed to do it. The other one, in the past you actually had to inject each one of those tentacles, so I don't know, you probably can't see them there. It could be up to 20 tentacles and you actually have to inject every one. Now in 2014, um, a university up in northern Queensland developed a bile salts. This is a single injection uh, that will kill the starfish. That was a game changer for us. We could now revisit, given that we have in machine learning, um, robotics in general and computer hardware, plus this ability to actually do an intervention um, to control their numbers. And it's, it, so that, that's what sort of made us do this prototype robot. So you saw this yesterday. This is Cotspot, Crown of Thorn Starfish robot. And it's a system for, so it has a camera on it for detecting the starfish. Um, so it's all on board. It's an autonomous system. 
um, for the detection and tracking of starfish. Uh, it uses acoustics for navigation on this particular vehicle um, and it just goes around hunting. You'll see exactly what it does in a second. Uh, obviously, it does rely pretty much on a deep learning type system. Uh, my colleague, Ferris Deo, developed this system. Um, but you need training data. And this is one of the issues that you have when you actually operate robots in the real world. So initially, we started using YouTube videos and anything online. The problem is they're glamour shots. They've been perfectly framed. They've been used flash, everything. So what we did is we actually made selfie sticks out of their injection systems that they use for controlling the starfish. And we got... 100,000 sort of types of images. And we classified them into, you know, easy, where you can see the whole starfish, difficult, maybe up to 40% of the starfish, uh, hard and impossible, where I couldn't even see the starfish in there. And we tried to classify, and we, we come up with a, with a model for them, very effective. And to give you an idea of what it does, so this is basically the robot is in real time processing the image. If you want to make yourself seasick, just watch hours of that on a boat. Um, and you can see here, the, we should play again. The, when it detects a starfish, it tracks it. And now the goal here is, OK, if we're looking at population numbers, um, we can use that information um, uh, for obviously directing a manual control team to do something. Um, however, we actually want to go one step further. While we're there, we actually want to take an intervention. And just give you an idea of what it does. So there is no starfish in this image, but it's a pneumatic system. The robot if goes down, injects, and rises back up. The reason why we fly that distance, I've asked, been asked a few questions, um, is we don't want to get stuck in coral. Uh, we've got to try and make it as quick as possible to be able to do this. This just gives a bit of a rundown, so what, we, what we're looking at. So this is a Great Barrier Reef. So if you do get a chance to go there, I highly recommend it. It's, it's a beautiful place. So... Again, we, in this particular case, we're using acoustics for navigation, obstacle avoidance, but uh, vision, real-time processing on board the vehicle for starfish detection and control. And it just sort of basically hovers about 1.2 metres off the seabed, um, just searching for the, for the starfish. And when it does detect one, this is actually from the onboard camera. When we get the bag file back, you can see basically what it's done. You can see there the, it's given the injection. Uh, in, in the solution sort of just comes out there. So that was a great proof of concept. We got incredible press around the world. I thought I was going to get hammered for building a robot that did that type of thing, but people saw what we are doing and thought it was a great idea to help protect a, a, one of the seven natural wonders of the world. But the problem is we want to be able to scale. That's one robot in the size of Italy. So we actually wanted to be... How do we make this more affordable, a more um, deployable system uh, that doesn't have to rely on a roboticist to control it. And, um, uh, yeah, and, and we can actually try and make a bit of a difference. So uh, just give you a bit of a background. Um, so traditionally, if you do work in underwater robotics, um, well, if you don't, typ the typical mode for navigation, communication, everything is using acoustics, sonar. These are very traditionally very expensive sensors, but you can get very good navigation performance out of them. Okay. But in reef environments where we do have reasonable visibility, you wouldn't use it in the Brisbane River if you've seen that. It's a bit brown, but um, up in the reef, it, it's, it actually makes a bit of sense to try it because you can start to do some visual idometry, some landmark detection. Um, slam, you can do all sorts of things. It requires onboard processing, um, but you know, it, it does make sense. And we've been able to demonstrate here and other groups around the world um, the, it does make sense to use it uh, where appropriate. Sorry. So we actually started looking back. This is, I think, the first one, Peter, that we did uh, when we started. Um, using vision only for uh, visual idometry. So this is way back in the days before NVIDIA products that, you know, you can do some really cool stuff. Um, but, you know, we're getting reasonable to... to we work on a, a metric of distance, uh, error of distance travel, you know, 2 to 8%, depending on the environment. Too much sand, it goes a bit, bit out. But um, it was OK. And we proved that the, the concept would work. We could do obstacle avoidance as well using vision. So this is back probably about 2007. So if it detects an object, it will go up. The, the, the systems were pr still pretty handheld. 
Um, but there's a lot of new visual odometry systems out there now. Uh, one, like LibVisio 2, I'm sure a lot of you have probably used it. Let's see if I can get this to run. No, sorry. I don't think that's going to run there. Anyway, but that's from the LibVisio 2 uh, wiki. You can, you can see they've done some like small scale, showing what it can do. Um, and what we've found, actually, we do employ um, a version of this on our systems. You can get quite reasonable performance out of it um, on, on the hardware. Um, now, one of the other problems, and this is something we started looking at um, a bit more now, we looked at it in the past, was trying to improve. If we're going to be using vis uh, vision, obviously visibility is a big issue for us. So how do we actually use vision um, or try and enhance imaging in real time? So this is some early work. One of the issues that you have when you go underwater, on the left-hand side, uh, light colour is actually preferentially absorbed uh, through the water column. So reds are dropped out really quick. So if you're in the shallow water, you have a lot of red, but you get even a couple of metres down, you lose a lot of red. Then depending on the amount of scatter, it's like driving through fog, you can, um, you, uh, yeah, you, you've got a, a lot of flare in the images and all sorts of things that cause you problems. So it's quite a challenging environment. Now, uh, a couple of years ago, we developed some work. Actually, that looks better on the screen here. Sorry about that. We've been looking at um, trying to do real-time visibility enhancement, so it's a bit of a chicken and egg problem. You sort of need a stereo depth map. I've actually seen some really cool stuff now from um, University of Minnesota. I actually saw it today, where they've been doing a bit more on this. Um, so there's some opportunity here, but this is something that we're really keen on trying to implement a bit more in our systems. Uh, you know, it, this was actually originally derived from some work that was done for autonomous cars seen through fog, and we thought, oh, it makes sense to, to try and adapt it to underwater. So that brings us to... Um, this next system, which is on display, it's only been publicly been displayed for two days now down at the QT stand, uh, called RangerBot. So we wanted to take basically what we learnt from the Cotspot so the, and all the previous work around the visual idometry nav navigation, create basically a drone of the sea that we could actually work on getting um, uh, Crown-of-Thorn starfish under control in some respect. Um, and it's a vision, robot vision only platform, everything is done on board. Now, one of the issues that we have, and being the motivation, as I sort of said in the past, we're trying to run everything on one platform. And even if you have got the best algorithm in the world, if you're taking up all my CPU time, I have nothing to do, uh, nothing left to do any obstacle avoidance or even the science mission itself if I've got to chuck it all into um, uh, navigation, for example. So it, it's been a, a, quite a big learning journey for us. And... Um, what we've done is we've developed this system here. Uh, you'll see it on this side. We're basically, we've packed in everything that we learned about robot vision. Um, we've actually upgraded the algorithms. Um, so Ferris has taken the original Crown of Thorn starfish detector that was a single... We could only track the strongest object within a, within a scene. It is now multi-object tracking. Um, so we can actually do some really cool stuff when they're in the starfish in aggregation. So we can now run this entire system on board a robot that weighs 15 kilos, uh, can go for it's about six hours, um, uh, and operate in, in reef environment. So we're very happy. So I do encourage you, if you do get a chance, to go and have a look down at the stand, um, what's going on there. This just gives you an idea of, you know, so very, very um, visibility, different tasks. So everything here um, is vision. So it tries to maintain altitude of about a metre to 1.2 metres off the seabed. Um, takes an object there, lifts up. Five, thank you. Yeah, that'll be good. And we've been trying, you know, when you get poor visibility, trying to go up a wall. So we, at the moment we're still doing pretty much linear transects um, within the environment. We are now literally with a collaboration with the Australian Institute of Marine Science, looking at more advanced missions where we actually do contour following around, uh, around coral reefs at set altitudes, and that's, that's going to be pretty exciting work over the next couple of years. So 
we've actually built a system, but one thing that we couldn't have done this without was actually simulation. Um, the, what we found was you just can't get enough time in the water generally, even though I spend half my life in cans um, on the Great Barrier Reef, um, but it is really tip, uh, difficult to get ground truth data. It's nearly impossible to be able to control the lighting conditions, the visibility of the scene. If you make a change on your algorithm, an hour later, the whole thing's just totally different. The tides are changed. So simulation sort of makes sense. And what we found was it wasn't really... Like, there's a lot of simulators out there, gazebo, UV sim, um, VREP, all sorts of things. Um, none of them sort of provided the level of fidelity for the imaging... Or, and the camera modeling that we wanted. So we actually developed our own. Now, even though the scene doesn't look like overly convincing of a coral reef, we can actually adjust every parameter here. We can, we can put um, distortion models that um, we can add slight offsets to the cameras. We can introduce fog. We've got lights, so we can actually uh, put directional lighting in here. And this is you know, fully integrated with ROS. It's developed in Unity. Um, and yeah, this, with, this will be made open source very uh, soon, but you have full control and you can actually evaluate your algorithms. We extensively evaluated all the parameters and all the different VO algorithms that we were trialling um, to do this. Now, it's great when you want to do obstacle detection, obstacle avoidance, um, uh, visual odometry, but obviously from a scene representation, it's probably not great for doing classification. So, one of, all right, but we can model things like this, um, this caustic, do all sorts of things in that scene. But obviously now there's even, like if you've got Unreal uh, Engine, so colleague uh, Daniel uh, has been starting to try and put, well, how can we start to more faithfully reproduce the environment? So if we want to start doing, adding classification for some of our navigation obstacle performance. Um, so, you know, there's some good opportunities here. And we're going to start, well, we will definitely be exploiting this a lot more now. Um, it worked really well for the Ranger bot, but some of the new projects around. So this is actually for the um, blue ROV that's been developed. So what's some of the op opportunities or, or probably some of the learnings um, from actually applying these algorithms in real environments? And some of the biggest things are a lot of the algorithms, particularly open source, fail badly. If they fail, they're going to fail badly and you're going to be in a lot of grief if, it's, if you've got a robot that's out doing something. Um, so I think there's an opportunity to um, try and build in some level of robustness or at least make algorithms fail gracefully and or predictably. We're already starting to see a lot of people working um, with probably the traditional feature-based visual idometry but leveraging some of the deep convolution convolutional neural networks um, to really um, sort of improve their performance and robustness and I think that's a very exciting place to be working on and given the sort of increase in uh, low power GPUs I think it's going to help a lot. One of the things that we're looking at also we do a lot of work obviously with marine scientists, uh, uh, natural resource authorities and that type of thing and one thing now that we're actually developing systems that can operate in the environment and actually do something pretty useful is how do we actually use them? Because they are slightly different from a human. If you're swimming in a reef, a robot is pretty much still looking down or forward, right? It's not doing what a human would do. We just have move around, oh, yeah, something's interesting over there. So how do you actually make a robot use information it's got um, to, uh, or even just the way that you deploy the robots in large numbers to actually get more information about the this environment and be able to do some sort of management applications. And I think there's still a lot that can be done about this uh, moving to sea uh, problem. And I'll give two brief examples here. So something that I've been working on for a bit um, is if you have poor visibility, can you actually assess that you have poor visibility and move your camera, or the robot in this case, to at least try and get a nice image? So from a mission perspective, you want to fly as high as possible so you avoid the corals, you avoid everything else, but obviously you have a, some sort of science metric, which is an image. So this just gives an example for Morton Bay here, which uh, this time of year is actually good visibility. In summer, it's pretty bad. Um, but at one metre flying altitude, you can't really make out the species of coral. Um, but, you know, you fly very low, but very risky. Um, you, can, you can start to make out some things. And where we're also looking at is now... Uh, camera targeting, so actually moving the camera so we can target uh, 
areas and ma still maintain mission uh, parameters. The other area is let's put the Amazon picking challenge on steroids and try and do something like this. So I don't know if you can count how many starfish are in here, um, but it's simply, you actually have to lift starfish off to get to the next starfish. Okay, and that's what a human would do. But still for a robotic system, it's impossible at this stage. Um, I, you, know, you even throw a, a deep neural network at that, I suspect it's probably not going to pick up nearly all of those. It's probably going to aggregate quite a bit. So there's some pretty much open, open problems there. So um, just in, in summary, I think transitioning robot uh, vision from the lab to the field is very challenging. There's a lot of things that even though you have the best intentions when you're developing your algorithms in the lab and you change your parameters, it still is a big step change to actually deploy the systems. But when you do do it, I think it's very rewarding. And um, it does require a bit different mindset because suddenly you don't have full access to your CPU. You have to share it with every other system that's on board. Um, but you can do stuff. I think there's some really nice work that's going to happen around moving to sea better. Um, complex interaction with natural environments. So actually getting the robots to do a task that has some national benefit. And I think we can uh, exploit some of the, you know, obviously I think Deep learning was probably the number one topic here at the conference, so I'm sure there's stuff that we can leverage. Obviously, I have a lot of people to thank for uh, colleagues and collaborators um, and funding of uh, institutions. So, thank you. Thank you, Matt. We have time for a few questions. Uh, there's a microphone right now, so if you have a question, put your hand up. So on that, um, that second vehicle that you just developed, um, have you considered doing combined traditional navigation methods as well as visual, geometry, or visual methods for, say, obstacle avoidance and detection, but still using traditional um, acoustics or whatever for big picture navigation? We would like to if the price point of the acoustics came down. So to give you an idea, the reason why we got the Google Impact Challenge money was our goal was to reduce the price of the original vehicle to a tenth of the price of the other one. And the only way we could do that was to remove all the acoustics. Um, we would love it because it actually helps the problem considerably if you can do that, right? But from a scaling perspective, we haven't. But yeah, if we've been talking with different manufacturers of low cost robotic systems for even altimeters, for example, they'll make a big difference, but they're not quite there. But hopefully, Kickstarters and all other things are coming out that might be able to do something for us. There's a microphone, sorry. What's the depth rating uh, for this robot? How deep you can go? Uh, so all our robots we just designed to 100 metres. Um, typically we operate less than 20. Um, I didn't mention that... When I mentioned the training, we classified the training into four broad classes, the easy ones that we could get, the hard ones, and the, the sort of the impossible ones. Now, the reason why they're impossible is we literally cannot get the injection system into the, into the coral. We could probably detect them just, but we can't get them in. Or the other ones are when they're hidden under corals. Uh, but at night time, the characteristics of these starfishes, they come out to grey, so we can operate at night. So we've actually got lighting on this new one. So that's where we're pushing the, the system as well for doing nighttime operations. Um, and we've had some good success with that so far. One last question. Uh, yeah. I, I can scream loud. All right. <laughs> so, how many non starfish have you injected so far? Non starfish? <laughs> if, if any. Zero. Uh, so, this, yeah, obvious, I didn't mention it, but it's a, obviously a precision recall problem. Um, so our recall is lower than probably what you'd expect. Our precision is very, very high. Um, and if you actually see the app that we've developed, because we've actually focused on citizen science users, um, the, all the images that are considered injection or have a high threshold that they could be, but we have, we decided not to do it, um, are recorded so we can actually improve the system. So that, you know, if there's an idea that could be, the system will leave Starfish. Uh, hi, uh, thanks for the presentation. So, uh, do you have any insight about uh, what is the reason behind starfish eating corals? Like, 
Is it a recent event or has it been happening forever or no, how, so how did it survive till now and what is it, why is it a problem now? Okay, biology of starfish 101. Okay, so these starfish are naturally occurring on our reef. They are essential for our reef. In their balanced numbers, which is no more than 35 per hectare, they actually eat the fast-growing corals and allow the slow-growing corals to uh, you know, produce. Now, the problem is that farming practices is the likely cause, and this is what's been um, sort of pushed as the, the key one, have released too much nutrients, too much fertilisation. So everybody working in precision agriculture, that's where you've got to make sure we don't use too much fertilisers, um, has run into the uh, waterways and into the reef. Now, these starfish have 60 million eggs per reproduction cycle. So even a fraction of an increase in larval survival is a massive problem. And when they get to a point where they can't, they run out of this fast growing corals, they just eat everything. So, yeah, hopefully that answers your question. Is there anything being done on the agriculture Yes, so the Australian government, I'll probably give it a plug. So the Australian government's just announced close to half a billion dollars to address everything that's on, not just for the starfish, but catchment practice through to uh, reef restoration and everything. So it's not just starfish. Now, we've had a couple of bleaching events that have caused a bit of grief with us. But um, yes, so there's, it's a slow process, but it is happening. Please join me in 